Um, so welcome to Prentice Center, AAPI Women in Church Leadership. And I'm really excited for today. Uh, this, this idea for this uh, panel conversation actually came from Mel Soriano, a member of the leadership team. He reminded me of that last night. I feel really excited about this because uh, in my experience in the church and in my uh, real life, my outside of life, I have found that when I come across AAPI women in leadership, I'm always amazed and surprised in some sort of magical way. And I've actually had interactions with some of our panelists and our moderator um, in, in the church leadership today, and I just find myself being always amazed at this unique, graceful, beautiful style of leadership that's so strong and courageous, it often um, moves me to tears. So I'm so grateful you're all here today. So I welcome you to the gathering. Is, we call it a space for Asian American spirituality. And for me, it's become a real, like a, a church home. And so we're wel we welcome you here, and we hope to welcome you back again and again. We center a lot of our events around food and really, <laughs> really just gather them together. So welcome. And a couple of housekeeping things. There's a bathroom. Uh, you could go that way to the bathroom if you need to use the restroom during the event. But also, you can go this way through the door and to the right and then down the hallway and there's a restroom. And please feel free to help yourself to uh, food and beverages and just enjoy. So I'd like to take this moment to introduce our panelists. Maybe our panelists can come and sit down. The panelists and moderator. So our first panelist is Julianne Suizio Hines. And Julianne is a macro social worker and social justice advocate who currently serves as a senior warden at All Saints Church Council. She's a lifelong resident of our county and is the granddaughter of Japanese immigrants whose experience has fueled her dedication to social and racial justice throughout her academic and professional career. Julianne has 17 years of experience in community organizing, government affairs, and nonprofit leadership, having previously worked in the California State Legislature and as an executive at Planned Parenthood. Welcome to you. And Charlene Jim Lee is a practical theologian who works in identity, voice, and context in spiritual formation, attending to the middle space between disruption and action, her teaching and scholarship in terms of theological grounded in lived experience and public witness. She is involved with advocacy for equitable housing solutions and workforce development. Charlene currently teaches at the University of Redland Graduate School of Theology and is discerning the transition to ordained parish ministry. Welcome, Charlene. Charlene Duffelmore Renker is an Episcopal priest and a member of the Providing Mission staff and staff officer of church planning. She is the founder of the Abbey, a non-traditional church plant in Birmingham, Alabama, that began as a coffee shop and is now a Sunday worshiping community. Katie has served large and small rural and urban congregations. She is passionate about helping the Episcopal Church live into its innovative, resilient, multicultural future. So we welcome Katie. And is an intercultural 
educator and consultant. And uh, I'll also say that Erica is uh, the biggest cheerleader in the Trump Gatherings, and we were so grateful.
24 hours or so, maybe it's a little maybe it's a weekend. Um, because I was like, why me, right? Like, oh my gosh. And, and then when I saw that, right, I was just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> And those categories that actually work against me in the so 
social order, a very lopsided order, I would say, and how I have found my own incomplete way of navigating through those limitations. And I know that when I speak my voice and give public language to my story, there is an inherent power that's given. And when it's joined by a collection of other stories, um, very different stories, but with that same kind of intention, then we galvanize the power. And so uh, early on when I started my academic career in a leadership consultation, a female leader, you know, one of the advice that she gave me is 80% of your job is showing up. And I'm not quite convinced of that because <laughs> there's that ethic in me that, well, like, I'm not prepared. I'm also intrigued by a mentor, an African American mentor, a scholar, who said that, you know, your job is to prepare, 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 because you got to know everyone else's story, you got to know the canon story, and you have to know your story. So when everyone's sleeping, you put the lights are on, you need to be prepared. So I have that ethic, and I thought the Korean ethic of me that you need to not just show up, but you've got to have some substance. Um, I thought, I don't know if I'm prepared, but I'm going to maybe trust the, the white female colleague leader who gave me that advice many years ago, 80% of your job is showing up. Um, so there's a little bit of, of, of vulnerability to be coming, and I, I told Eric it was great to come. I feel like everyone else is really organized. And I just need to come and say some things that are true, uh, to be a truth teller to my own story. And so that invitation felt really clear, it was in Peter's invitation and in yours. And, so, um, and as a non-Episcopal person, who I always think if I were Presbyterian, I would be Episcopal. <laughs> so, uh, I was excited to be a part of uh, this community which is different from the places where I usually have these conversations. Thank you for your warm welcome. Full disclosure, not all of us in this room might be Episcopal. <laughs> <laughs> in various shapes and forms. But that is really something that we appreciate about um, this diocese and the gathering, that we have been given a lot of freedom to have this initiative and to use these facilities and to be able to be grounded in the Episcopal Church's hospitality and still say, we are open to people of all faiths, no faiths, any faiths. What we do in this space has value and has power for everybody. Amen. So, you're in the company. <laughs> Thank you uh, for those honest and powerful answers. I think. It's interesting to think about that 80% of the job is showing up and you're saying representation, that idea of if you can see it, then you can be it. Um, I think that representation is such a big piece of maybe why it's important for us to be sitting up here. Katie, you're talking about like, where were you all? How did I not find you? A part of that is, you know, the times that you lived in, it's only been very recently that you've had the opportunity with social media, with you know, the kind of more connected, digital connectedness that we all are forced into as well in the last three years, um, to be able to see other folks who look more like us and to be able to combine these things in this sort of very powerful space. And I would say as well, it has only been recently and much through the gathering of this group that I really started to think about what does it mean to be um, progressive and to be a Christian and to be Asian American. And then also to add that gender piece in as somebody who identifies as a woman. And that's what I would love to turn to now is just especially for personal stories. Well, like you said, you're, you're truth telling of your own story because, yes, it's always unfinished, isn't it? I mean, we're living forward, we're living into growth. And part of our synergy and collaboration here is also that affirmation that comes out of each other's stories. So with that kind of foundational piece, I really would love to now turn to talking about not just gender roles, but cultural gender roles in the church. Um, I would love to talk about like maybe some context because I never want to assume that folks here have background necessarily even in the church of any kind of denomination. Um, just maybe for the context of like 
how and why leadership in the church has historically been so limited in women. Why are we seeing ourselves, not just as Asian Americans, but also as women in the church? And um, also, maybe we can definitely talk about the fears and stereotypes and the limitations that maybe have come with those stories. Maybe also just how you experienced that and, and even dealt and wrote with them. So we can think about that for a moment too. We can all think about that. <laughs> Consciousness that I don't really belong here. 
And just briefly, I'll go and share the, the story that they shared before in such a context. And I think it resonates because it still has a residual kind of pain mixed in the humor. Um, so I'll take a minute, just taking a minute to tell the story. So I preached on Easter morning um, in, in, in a church uh, where I was serving. And after I was standing in the back with the other pastoral staff, shaking hands uh, with the congregants. This is before COVID, so we're shaking hands, like, you know, all of that thing. And people were like, uh, there was a woman who came, I did not recognize her, and she just had, like, big, blonde, big hair, that I remember. And I remember the feeling of her hard, acrylic, bright pink nails, like, digging into my small hands, shaking my hand. And she said, Wow, I think it's just marvelous. You've learned to speak English with L and accent. I didn't know to accommodate her compliment. I didn't know if this was the time where I bring my incisive voice into this pastoral <laughs> encounter. Um, and I think just a moment was just quick and it passed by. But that's just, it's kind of scary. Because I experience, and I think we recognize those moments, um, I've experienced different layers of that, and it compounds over time. That makes you really question at every turn when situations arise. Is this about me and that person as humans, or are there layers of unchecked, unexamined kindness, acceptance, but at someone else's terms and not mine, where my difference is not recognized? Um, and so, so yeah, I, I live in that very awkward space of not belonging fully, but there's restrictions, and I have to kind of choose where do I feel I can flourish into the one that, that God sees me as the one that is calling me to, to do and to be part of the one of me. And in this earthly world, I don't think we'll ever find that spaciousness that we like, but that's where I live and do my work. I think a lot of this is a great place to ground ourselves in a general way. I saw a lot of nodding and resonance with that idea of acceptance and even well meant kindness, good intention about someone else's choice. This is Yeah, I just have a question that like almost brings tears to my eyes. I'm sorry. I think it's the, it just expresses this tension. Yeah. In, um, doing, particularly doing the work of ministry as somebody who stands out and is different and is frequently misunderstood. And yet, and yet it's like also my job to convey to another person their own belovedness, right? And, and have the grace to. Um, yeah, I have the grace to know when an encounter is about them and not about me. Um, but that's a, it's just a hard thing. So um, I think one thing I've started to come to realize too is that our mainline Christian denominations really are, uh, this, this is in the words of Alan Roxburgh, the theologian, uh, Euro tribal churches. And so he talks about the, you know, the kind of the decline um, and unraveling of the Euro tribal churches. And it's like, oh, oh yeah, right? Like the, the Presbyterian, Scotland, the Lutherans, Germany, uh, Episcopalians, England. Um, and I mean, we, you know, in the Episcopal Church, we've got all the Book of Common Prayer. But there's also, I mean, all of our favorite words, vestry, <laughs> and <laughs> parish, canon. Uh, I have a friend that 
tattoo artist in Birmingham and his studio is just down from the cathedral, so he sent me a message one day. He's like, what's a very reverend? <laughs> 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 oh yeah, we have all these little terms that we've inherited, not from any American tradition, but from you know, our scripture vocabulary. Um, and all that's great, you know, it's like, um, I, I was a supply priest once at, at my home, uh, the, the church that I grew up in, and I was really excited about it. Uh, and it was Christmas Eve or something, and I put on the, um, the coat. And it's about three feet too long. <laughs> and so I just like drag the floor. But it, it's like these vestments, these things, these terms, these structures, they have to be fitted for somebody. They can't be fitted for everybody. You know, the coat's got to be made. It's probably made for somebody who's six and a half feet tall. Um, and that's okay. Um, but then what? How do we take that idea of belovedness and this faith and even these traditions that, you know, maybe Euro tribal centric? Um, but then for some reason or another, we, we claim you're adopted. Um, I'm having a real struggle right now with clergy vestments, just the, the symbology of it, because I, uh, at least in, in Southern Providence or Diocese, you know, the, the male clergy are walking around in the, um, what's that thing that like ties behind your back? The, uh, cincture? The, not the cincture? No, no the black, the... like the vest. Oh. And, and it's like a three-piece Oh, right, 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 right. <laughs> I can't remember what it's called. I don't. It's a good one. Oh, you know, it's going to be like a white dress shirt, and you put that thing on, and the collar, and then your black jacket over it. And, and it's, uh, I mean, it's like clergy formal wear, and they wear it every day. And it's very cool, and I try to find female versions of that. It's not really nice. But, but my ministry's been in... Um, in a, in a church coffee shop setting on, on the margin of the community where I found myself mopping up blood, sweat, tears, all kinds of things, vomit on a daily basis. I can't wear fancy clergy <laughs> gear. Um, so what does it look like to, you know, to create something that, um, yeah, that really allows me to bring the fullness of who I am and the fullness of, of what my ministry is Um, and having to 
it, it really wasn't until sort of I moved into San Diego Valley <laughs> and there were all these Asian people and um, really then felt more embraced and um, came to understand how much of male culture really was very Asian without me knowing it um, because of the influence of my um, mother and my mother's family. Um, so like I got off on a tangent about where I was going with all of this. But I think in terms of the church, sort of going back to the original question, I'm not a theologian, I'm a social worker, I'm an active social worker where I work as a system and communities and institutions. And, and the church is really just a reflection of society, you know? And um, probably moves slower than lots of lots of portions of society. But we know that this is a community, you know, this is the reality for women in our day and for um, people of color in our day is that we live in a society that centers the status quo of white women cultures and centers patriarchy. This is where we live. Um, and so we, you know, it, it's not surprising then that this is what's reflected in the church because the same power struggles that are happening um, in our, you know, outside of church lives are happening in the inside of church lives. Um, and that, that is the work that is set before us. And I know that's one of the reasons why I really love, you know, my, my 27th book for All Saints, why I love being All Saints is because um, our vestry has really said that this work of dismantling um, oppression that comes from centering this dominant white culture, that is the work of our generation of people. Um, and it's not easy work. It's not like, oh, here's the 10 steps of where we're going and how we get there and, and, and what we're going to do to make this all better. It really is a journey. It's an iterative. It's creative. Um, it's saying we have to go on a journey before we really know where the destination is. And we're going to hit lots of roadblocks and we're going to hit lots of, you know, um, forks in the road that we have to choose. Are we going to go this way? Are we going to go that way? Are we going to try? Um, and it's um, incredibly painful work for everybody involved. Um, and if we don't engage in this work, um, it, you know, this culture is so damaging and um, is really one of the major blocks to getting what God's calling us to, which is beloved community. And, and beloved community and community cannot exist for oppression of people exist. So, um, you know, it's, it's a journey. It's hard. <laughs> um, and, it, and it is interesting just sort of how how things show up. I, I almost have sort of like the flip side of experience usually where I feel like we're sort of my Asian culture gets used to diminish me as a leader is not in sort of like the backhanded compliment. It's really more when I'm not showing up the way I'm expected to. And I think there is this sort of cultural norm of what old leadership looks from a very sort of white dominant culture centric idea of leadership. And then there is this idea of what particularly the human, um, how she behaves and how she shows up and that Humility and the graciousness, and you know, and when you are speaking your truth and calling somebody on their behavior that may be sentimental, um, the way they respond isn't to be able to like respect it, but it's to sort of diminish me and say, Oh, well, she's just angry. Um, <laughs> 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 um, but there's truth, but she's just angry. Um, so yeah, it, it, it is, I think there's a lot of um, sort of identity uh, barriers, you know, for us that it's, it is, it, it is that code switching that you're talking about, I'm saying, like, am, am I safe to show up this way here or do I need to show up this way? Like, who do I need, you know, what's the discerning voice I need to have this moment and what's going to be accepted? Capacity to read context is a strength that we have developed that muscle out of painful and incredible experiences 
that we can enter into spaces and just quickly analyze like what is the expectation? Am I going to meet it or am I going to resist it? Am I going to challenge it? Um, so that, I think we take that for granted that we know how to read context very well um, and in a very complex way, right? And in a very embodied way, like, you know, physically, spiritually, psychologically, what is the energy here and how am I going to feel here? Um, that, that is, that kind of agility is a skill that many people who can walk into spaces and not have to do that reading have not developed. And so I claim that as one of the, one of, I would say gifts, one of the skills I have learned and I know kind of figure out how to use it. I, I appreciate that contextualization because I think sometimes for folks that live in liberal spaces, whether it's being biracial, whether it's being um, an ethnic um, minority, so to speak, even though that word is tricky, as we know that numbers don't point to that, but it has to do with balance of power. Um, whether it is around our identity as being Asian Pacific Islander Americans, or perhaps our sexual orientation, perhaps our gender identity and fluidity, perhaps it has to do with even where we are in what means a leader. These are that code switching or the recontextualization, the reading of the room, so to speak. I don't know if I've ever thought of it as a spiritual gift before. And I know you were not sure about your choice of the word gift, but I'm thinking about that now because we're sitting here in our female Asian-ness, and that's, those are very embodied traits. And then when we talk about our spiritual identity, in some ways that's also very embodied, isn't it? And so I think, I think there is a certain joy, perhaps, in looking at these things that maybe have been seen as limitations before and asking for those, that, that sort of spiritual eyes to see, wait, how is this actually a gift? What is this thing that perhaps I'm calling a limitation that perhaps is actually a good gift that comes from the parent because of whom they're associated? I will be chewing on this, my friends, this week. <laughs> and I hope you will too. I actually would love to hear from you in that space. Like we've all we've all talked about kind of redefining leadership and agreed that whether we look at it from that sort of theological ecclesiastical uh, perspective and or that macro social, uh, psychosocial perspective of yes, the church is still change. Can what would be like a sort of one phrase, sort of one, like, putting you on the spot of what would you want leadership to be? Or what are you embodying this? What's leadership then? If it's not, if it's not white and patriarchal, what is a beloved picture of leadership? Again, we take space. <laughs> <laughs> We laugh nervously because we're conditioned in our systems to respond right away. Reflection is also part of the kind of understanding. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about um, something Bishop Shin in New York says, and it, it just knew a lot to me. Um, he wasn't talking about women in particular, but 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 Asian Pacific Islanders in the United States have this really important role in um, pulling back the folds of the beloved community because we inhabit an in-between space, um, and I I sense that I, I don't know. I, may be different, but I, I certainly feel in Alabama and the South, 
Um, but that in the green space that I, I live in, which, you know, the, the downside to it has been always feeling like I don't belong anywhere, but there, that's actually a gift now. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I had my church plant, the Abbey is, I mean, there's a few Asian members, but everybody else is white. And we are currently sharing a church space with a historically black Baptist church. And we come, we come together for a little like cohort meeting once a month just to, just to talk. And the, the white folks were being really vulnerable and saying, you know, um, we're afraid of this neighborhood we're finding ourselves in because we look outside at all of the, the houses and the, the housing project apartments and everybody's black and we're actually, we're actually afraid and feel very vulnerable here. And then the, um, the people from the Black Baptist congregation were saying, we're terrified. And I found myself in this really interesting place in that conversation where you know, there's a friend of it that said, well, I, I'm kind of afraid of both of you. <laughs> <laughs> but none of you is afraid of me. <laughs> there's a piece of that that I don't like. I don't want people to be as <laughs> The birth of Jesus, and there's just nothing intimidating or fearsome about that scene that Luke paints. And so, like, what is the gift of being somebody that like nobody is afraid of? Um, what's the we, we talked a lot last year about the invisibility of Asian American women. Is there a gift to that invisibility? Um, there's places that I can go and groups people, people I can be in. They're like, maybe I don't have any power or any voice, but but I'm invited into spaces that. Not everyone's invited into. I'm invited to preach in some places and some some churches where people are very different from me than you know maybe my colleagues in the school church would be invited into. Um, yeah, so I think when I think about that, that question, what's the spirituality of this? Um, I'm, I'm wrestling with that. Yeah, like what's the gift? The 
journey truly is really what does matter. Because you might find a destination, but you, you're not going to find it unless you live. Mm -hmm. So just adding that. In terms of, you're not going to get, I hear that a lot of us in engineers. Those are really helpful points of departure. I don't really know what I was thinking initially when you asked the question about what does leadership look like. Yeah, and then somebody who teaches leadership, I'm like, what, what is leadership? <laughs> but I can say what leadership looks like for me if I have body it and I, and I have um, learned it and am learning in it. Um, I learn to be a leader and a teacher and who I am in that location. When my first, my actual very first teaching job was teaching eighth grade English in middle school in East LA in the nineties, and um, encountering young people whose daily realities are tragically and traumatically so offensive to the human experience in ways that my insulated life never knew. Um, they taught me something. That still carries with me that I carry to every classroom that I enter. Um, which is which is this? And, and I would, I'm going to borrow Zora Neale Hurston's words because it kind of captures. It says, "Love makes the soul fall out from its hiding place. Love works." Is what I wrote in my journal after teaching eighth graders after going through, you know, uh, every, twice every month I went to vigils for drive-by shootings in the time when being violent was just just the reality of life. Um, being really intimidated to be in front of eighth graders that were much bigger than I remember when I was eighth um, But I learned from that place um, that love works, that's what I wrote down. Um, and so, any place where um, I'm afraid to be a leader, I know that love works. And I know that one of the giftings I had, I wasn't sure about the gift of being able to read context because it's admired in having to do it, um, is just my, uh, uh, my capacity to love does it come from my own conjured up ability. I know that's a gift that's beyond the source of beyond me. And so far, the track record of love working <laughs> has convinced me it may look different. The forms of love may look different. The voice may be different. One of the students in that eighth grade class, this is like a long time ago, wrote me a, a note at the end of the year. And he said, Miss Jen, you were the only gentle sound I heard throughout my day. Hmm. And as someone who does not have a loud voice or have a big presence in a space, um, I receive that. I don't think I knew at that point, but I know that there is power and gentleness that is earnest and sincere that just extends to take the risk of loving without calculating will they receive it or not receive it. Mm -hmm. And there's confidence and then there's leadership in being the one who's going. And I would say on top of that as the API people, anyone who doesn't fit whatever we have decided or not decided, whoever has decided as a norm as a status quo, all of us probably don't fit into that you know, central norm. Um, those things that we've developed because we don't want, like that feeling of like, how can I use what people perceive it as invisibility and as my strength. I, I resonated with your story, and I was like, you know, there's a reason why I like being in airports, because nobody belongs there, and no one's claiming this is my nice earth. We're all just traversing here to there. And I just like that feeling of real sense of peace. Like, no one's really in charge. <laughs> and we're all moving from one place to the other. And so, um, where was I going with this? So kind of the gift that I that we have, maybe not by choice, but by experience of being not included, not welcomed, maybe in very implicit ways, in very covert ways, it's like when people don't recognize you because 
or they think you're somebody else that they met because they think you're <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I worry when I go to places where I've been having acquaintances that people will not recognize me. And that, we don't talk about that, but that's a real, like, another filter that I have for myself. So all those things, when you are given authority at least, you know, for whatever time to time, to be one who is voicing for the community or leading the community, what we have is those experiences of being invisible, being not heard, being not loud enough, and then attending to those people and places of question who, who is not here. And the, those kinds of, and you know, we're talking about somewhat lightheartedly, but compounded over time, these like become real sustained traumas. Um, in our psyche and our bodies, those wounds, as people of faith, if if those wounds can find healing, and those parts of us that become so thin and worn out can receive the light, and then become strong again. Um, what I mean, I guess in some ways, I, I could attribute to now I'm kind of wounded healer. Concept. I don't want to attribute too much to that. But that idea of when you have been hurt um, and you've had some glimpse of redemption from those pains, I think that really prepares you for ministry. Mm -hmm. And that really, I think people who love generously have painful stories to them. Yeah. Right? And compassion comes from having experienced and incurred injury in your life. And so that kind of meaning from, in, for, love is the leadership particularity that I hope I can, I am moving to, and that I am moving to. Yeah. I've heard it said that what's paid for in the point of pain is dearly held in generous And I think that definitely, that's what we're hearing. Um, from a, a theological, aka scriptural standpoint, you were told perfect love casts out fear. What is that perfect part? Not transactional, generous, coming from a place of woundedness or, or deficit, right? Not a place of necessarily easy or plenty. Um, the, the widow's way, you know. So, I'm. I'm wondering what what kinds of to, to bring it to the theology against perspective. And, but speaking from your, your particular lived experiences in vocational and what you do, when I say theological, what I truly mean is, is the idea of, of spiritual truth, of of gradualness in a faith conversation, of, of what is scripture theology that has or is now grounding you in in what you're doing. Um, vocationally in the church tradition, or just living your life as somebody on a journey. Um, what gives you that motivation and inspiration, I guess, to continue in a church or spiritual leadership role? And also curious if you have had any API female role models along the way, or people that we can look to to expand our understanding. The scripture that brings me back to that belovedness that um, we have all can use that language because I think it does reflect our desire and the reality of the Is there scripture in Isaiah when the Israelites were confused and without hope, which is a lot of the times, but all the times? Um, when you look to your left and you look to your right, hear a voice from behind saying, this is the way, walk in it. And when I feel like things are coming my way and I'm not prepared for it, and 
I don't have the strength this time around to fight through my fear and move forth and press on with courage. Um, that's what you're promising. When you look to my right, to my, to my left, or to my right, I will hear a voice from behind saying, This is the way, walk in it. And when I'm wondering, What is that way? <laughs> Part of my faith practice is trusting in this way of love. And as simple as it sounds, um, that is the work that my soul is called to. And that is my highest calling. And sometimes um, that will disadvantage me on kind of a social currency or a political currency in the small spheres in which I do my work. Um, but that is. That is my expression of discipleship and my own spiritual formation. I hear people using this phrase um, recently that really resonates with me. It's, um, you know, I've moved to a new city and I'm looking to find my people. And I, I get that. Sort of, I guess, my, my guiding north star um, 
and where I didn't really have, through this, I get into these really weird spaces in terms of um, like my vocation, because I don't have like a goal of this is the position I want to do, and this is the work I want to do. It's really coming back to this concept of defense the oppressed um, that resonates for me and, and how I'm living that, how I'm embodying that in my life. And so that, that has guided a lot of sort of my leadership and, and how I show up. Um, but what happened is because these spaces, you know, I was in the political world, I was in a very contentious nonprofit world that was being attacked on, on the daily, if not the hourly, um, that it was sort of like this warrior persona that had to sort of rise up, which is really in conflict with who I am. Um, but like that's what I was called for. And um, so for 17 years, I, that's what I was doing. It was just like, okay, stand on the front lines. And um, defend and defend and defend and build up this sort of hard bits and where there were people who were kind of afraid of me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if I was coming for you, were coming for me. But um, I think the lesson of the last two, three, maybe four years has really been like, I'm tired because that's not who I am, right? That is not um, the authentic gifts that I was given. It was they, these were skills that I had built, and they benefited me in a sort of like social currency kind of way in, in, um, in, in this way of how I showed up in the community and how I was thought of. And I realized it's not who I am. It really isn't. And I was just talking to one of our associate directors this week. He said, you know, I don't want to be a warrior anymore. I want to be soft. <laughs> because that's who I am. And, and it is, really does come down to love and how are we showing um, and so that's the lessons that I've been kind of learning. Um, and then something that distilled for me this summer, we had Christine Yisa come and speak at our church. And um, if you've never read her poetry or her writings or been able to hear her speak, um, she's on the All Saints podcast, but listen to it, it was amazing. And um, she talked about um, Mary through the male gaze. And she's really talking about Mary. And it just, you know, really kind of reminded me and rooted me in this idea that um, the systemic oppression and silencing of women is not now. <laughs> it's been going on forever. Um, it's always been this way. And I think that in some ways, there is a huge fear of the women. Women's voices. Um, and I think that um, women have a way of telling truth that is very threatening to the status quo and calls the status quo to be better. Um, and and I, I'm a little all over the place, but um, I was listening to this podcast and uh, this um, psych sociologist had asked. You know, were you raised with the concept of autonomy or were you raised valuing the concept of loyalty? And of course, like everybody who raised their hand of autonomy, were you were raised in America, right? Because, you know, that's the big American value. But when you really look at um, other countries, and I think this really comes from sort of being brought up by an Asian woman, is loyalty was really. Thing, you know, the thing that my mom was always telling us is like, you're going to have friends come and go, but people are going to come and go in your life, and your sisters are the only ones who are going to be there with you and pray for you. And so you have to, like, you've got to circle up, you've got to protect your sisters, you've got to uplift your sisters, you have to be in a relationship with them, um, and know that they're always going to be there. And she, she's really right, my sister's my best friends to this day, but um, it, it is that, that idea of. Um, you know, that I think where we lose in social capital is not that because our, my tendency is not to say, oh, look at me, look at all these great things that I've done. It's like, look at the community, look at the group, look at the family, right? It's like my family, look at my church, family, look at my church group, and here's, here's where we want to uplift, here's where we want to um, show what we're doing. And it's not about putting myself forward. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's find who else we're looking for, and it's not going to be me, but it, you know, because it's, it's more that concept of loyalty and that value of loyalty. Um, so I went way off topic, I think. 
And it's all insights and wisdom that we can have. Um, I think it's interesting that, um, you know, asking for grounding scriptures, everybody named prophetic voices from what we would call the Old Testament, or from the Abrahamic scriptures. Um, my own answer to that, by the way, is also my God to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk in way. So I find that interesting. I, I'm not going to draw any conclusions from that. I just find that interesting. <laughs> um, I don't think this is necessarily, but it's not going ranging off topic at all because all the kind of uh, weaves together, the, the idea of what is love, what, how is that? very vividly tied into the power of not just being a woman in leadership, but an API woman in leadership. How do those things, and, and, and I think we've heard that very clearly. Um, I think it's interesting sometimes to redefine and to recontextualize and to reframe and just play with those areas sometimes and see what rises out of that. I think we've heard so much of that. So it's so rich in this last, I don't know, how long have you done? I don't remember. <laughs> um, I want to, I want to kind of look a little farther, like ahead maybe, of where you stand now. Like when you're saying, look, you know, when you look to the right, when you look to the left, oh, you will hear the voice. And it, 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 it's, it's, we're talking about all the cardinal directions, right? There's this sort of, 360 view, I love that kind of idea there. Thinking of that kind of 360 view, maybe, what kind of advice or encouragement would you want to give leaders in the next generation? Or even maybe in this current generation of, of women, especially API and church leadership? Um, how yeah, I'll just leave it there. I was going to say about like developing leadership. No, that's
conclusion will be when I no longer have to, I'm no longer looked at as part of the radical inclusion, right? <laughs> so it's, it's really looking at those systems and how do we create the space and the value for the other voices that are coming to the table. And if you want me to show this my authentic self, then you better make space for that and you, can, you better value that um, before I'm willing to do it. Oh, thank you for saying that. Yeah. Because yeah. I want to take it back off of it. And um, Episcopal Church is the only context I know. <laughs> so I'm going to speak from that context. When, you, um, when I get on the website for the church pension group, which records all the salaries and benefits of Episcopal Church clergy, uh, Asian American women are paid the least of any ethnic and gender category. And I've never heard anybody say anything about it. I've never heard that being talked about. I don't know why it is. Um, but if you like, look at the little charts, it's pretty glaring to me. Um, I think there's a lot of AAPI female church leaders working for free. Um, and I think that that's part of the, I think that's part of the gift, <laughs> right? I think mean, that, there, that there's a commitment among uh, Asian American women to the gospel. And like, you know, my God, like, I will continue this ministry and I will lead this community I will let go into these forgotten places whether I am being paid or not. And the Apostle Paul would be so proud. <laughs> <laughs> but the people who advocate for us should not let that happen. And that's a stain upon the, the, the denomination. That's a stain upon the system. And I would guess, I can't be sure, but I would guess that that's a similar pattern in many of the other mainline denominations because there's a um, there's just this inner sense of well she's off doing the jail ministry or she's off doing the homeless ministry or she's got this Korean church plan but you know her husband makes enough money that she can do it for free or <laughs> you know it's this forgotten group of people it doesn't matter <laughs> Not the ministry doesn't matter, but it doesn't matter to me. Um, I, I think that there's just a general apathy around, around these issues of justice within the church. That if we don't pay attention to them, it's it's gonna contribute even more to this unraveling that Alan Rockstar talks about. I mean, our, our denominations are unraveling, and, and it's these voices from the large where that they have the best chance of of saving the tradition that we love. So, so what advice? Um, I think part of it's that to the wider institution, maybe it's to AAPI women in leadership to say, um, it may not be part of your personal charisma to do the kind of advocating for yourself, which I just hate that <laughs> But uh, find somebody who will advocate for you. Create networks of people, create relationships with people who can advocate for you and for your ministry. Um, and then the flip side of that advice is um, make sure you're using whatever position you have to advocate for others. Make sure you're advocating for your black sisters and brothers. Make sure you're advocating for your uh, Latino um, uh, sisters and brothers who are also in, in ministry because, you know, in their, Jeremiah 29. Right, in their welfare, you will find your welfare. Thanks for both of your prophetic um, voices there, right? To really look at, don't ask us what to do. <laughs> ask the system, right? Or demand the system to consider. Um, there's something that I think Katie was speaking to that resonated with what, where I first was thinking of this. Question, and that's not coming to me right now. But I, one of the things that I have learned over time, um, this tension of where does humility fit into leadership, right? 
Um, it's when people that look like us lead out of humility. It's like soft or it's not enough. Um, and then perception is there. You can't control their perceptions or how the external perceptions. And there's that external um, realities have a force in impacting how we understand ourselves. Uh, one thing that I have um, thought about is for me, humility before God doesn't all usually does not mean I stand and or sit in the back. Because that's what I'm comfortable with. Humility before the call on my life is making my steps forward and sitting in the front. And um, I, would, I would offer that, I don't know if that's advice, I would offer that kind of image or reflection is maybe if you really were humble before God and God's proclamation of who you are and the call on your life, maybe you need to take that Occupy that space that is a central place that you feel like, oh, I'm not me. I am co co-leading a group of Asian American women in ministry, prepare for ministry, and with an invitation to partake in the panel. I was like, oh, I don't know if I can. I don't know if I'm the right person. And I have said the very same things. Like many of you have said the very same things. And that's what I'm saying, you know, if I'm humble before God, I can say, I feel incomplete, I feel I'm inadequate, but I will go forward. And um, so it's kind of re understood for myself what humility means. And now, kind of going back to where um, the both of you had offered to us, is honestly, like self advocacy is so tiring. And the burden <laughs> is, is part, it's part of you are. You're going to have this advocate. But goodness, if you could have a community of people, we'll say, why don't you sit down and keep your friend with the We'll take care of this. Let, we're going to go look at that chart on that website and let's figure out what's going on. That, that will give you a resurgence of fuel to sustain your journey. And what I would, um, I would also say to people who maybe are in ministry or feeling isolated or feeling like it takes work, but you need to find people who are not just advocating for you, you need people who are just gonna love you. And that you feel so precious and loved and seen and feel cocoon. Not someone who's giving you like constructive feedback. Which is something that we just love you. That's why we say, well, we're going to work on this project. We're going to put our voices, and we have me in that side of us is active in the room. And some of us is, come and rest and just let me cook you something that you want to eat. <laughs> <laughs> um, when, I first, um, when I first went to the position, I was a first Asian American faculty at the Moral Constitution where I was first hired. And so at that time, when I engaged the Asian American kind of community conversation, because people were calling me, oh, how can we support you? Can you come and speak? And I had not seen myself as a, a, a scholar who looks at Asian American issues. That's just part of my identity. But I, then I said, why don't we get a lot of Asian American stuff? Well, just talk about you, because I can do that. And when I, one, of the, one of the calls that I recall is from a female. Clergy, with them many projects with, who I learned a lot about in her um, She said, Come over to my house and we can come down to you. But do you know what that is? It's like a very traditional Korean soybean stew. And I remember just walking to her backyard and she had made tender jigae in a bowl that's like just a pot, a single serving pot. Just for me. And I remember that. And she and I have really gone through some conflicts <laughs> in our done, done, dealt with some real genuine work of looking at each other and saying, like, this is what you have said I meant to you over the years. But I always go back to that view. And um, so I would say, find people. And they may not be people who look like you necessarily, but oftentimes they will be who will just just partake in mutual love. 
up or even in a very just like uni uni what's the word? unidirectional thought. You're just receiving. Yeah, not transactional. Where you don't have to be like, oh, I'll pay you back for that next time. Where you you see, it is a gift if you can find one person who can provide on that, but you can find community. And sometimes, for me, the people who nourish me are, yes, real people who are in my physical spaces, but also through people who write, and I, they become my mentors through my reading and my consumption of their work. So, I mean, there are creative ways, and we all long for that. And if we can begin by extending that to others, then maybe the community can really emerge, right? So all of you who have any sort of um, relationship with somebody who is looking to the church as a place to live out her life, call her, talk to her, embrace her, make her Tinder ticket, or, you know, <laughs> people are, whether they are in a very visible place of leadership or not. And um, we all want that kind of thing. And that's why I would say, seek it out, like I would say to our community, including all of us. That's all. Thank you for that wisdom that has collectively gone. Um, before we bring it to a close, we want to open it. This is a conversation. And we're wondering if anyone here has questions or feedback that they'd like to give, um, or especially questions, anything that you're thinking about or worrying about. And again, we would love for some of the holy signs of reflection. Well, that's happening here. We'll also give you an NIC. Um, some reflection if there's anything that we haven't said yet that you want to express. Thank you for this incredible panel. Um, I'm wondering the last three years of a global crisis upon global crises, have you seen glimmers of what could be possibly Asian cultural values appearing as humanity tries to support itself more that you feel look like a glimmer of optimism? That's a really, and just for the folks, because I don't know if the folks on um, the internet were able to hear that. Um, oh gosh, that was a, a lot easier to kind of phrase it. It's just looking at the last three years of this sort of global pandemic, are we seeing any um, signs of maybe Asian cultural values um, showing up? And um, are there any numbers of hope in that? Yeah, I'm sure. Um, so the one thing that I was, I was kind of like laughing to myself when um, uh, when Charlie was talking was um, a lot of sort of what she is lifting up and, and talking about when you look at a lot of the um, sort of literature on leadership today. It's actually a lot of the, the values that maybe we might have as we can do. actually make for better managers <laughs> and make for better parents, right? And this idea of um, curiosity and questioning and uplifting each other and looking at the go through um, rather than having the answer, right? And, and this independence um, and this idea of the, you know, sort of the iconic leader. Uh, the visionary theater is, is actually in these times where we don't know what the destination is. Uh, there's no such thing as a visionary theater where you don't know where you're going, how can we have the vision to know how to get there, and it really is looking at iteration and looking at how do we 
we try and um, take feedback and listen and um, create the spaces where we can try something and it doesn't work and it's still it's a safe space to say, okay, well, what didn't work and how do we improve and how do we iterate? Um, and so I think that there is this sort of understanding in this movement that this value of independence um, has sort of gotten us into the moment we're in. And, and saying the, the value of loyalty and collectivism and, and coming together is going to be the way that we can maybe grow out of that and grow beyond that. And so I do see some glimmers of hope in that direction. Um, in that, um, it, it, I, you know, I, I follow and read a lot of the sort of like leadership literature of the day. Um, and that seems to me a lot of like where we're heading and, and really this recognition and this understanding of that sort of, of management um, and really sort of what we call the soft skills, right? Which are harder um, than like learning how to code or something like that, right? Um, so I don't know if we come up on this idea that there's soft skills from, you know, because the historical, because they came from one Yeah, so. I don't know. That's awesome. I don't know. <laughs> That's a beautiful question, and um, the question does reflect something about where, you know where we are. That um, so I don't want to offer a pat answer to such maybe a question that you think about. But yeah, this idea of leadership, whether it's in a smaller community or national or international. You know, um, I know like in my own in the world, we talk about adaptive leadership, and I think that's what many of us do. And that's like a skill or technique to be learned. And so this is what I talked about with the beginning, this agility that we take for granted that just lived in ourselves um, is now, you know, something that's valued. Whether it's, I'm not convinced though that we do look for that kind of leadership. We look at what's happening in our nation and in other nations, where the kind of leadership expression is not adaptive and it's working, right? The masses look for that kind of big voice, confidence drive. Um, and so, yeah, I'm not sure. I think conceptually we like the idea and it works in, in maybe boundaries of communities. I don't know. I don't really have any answer. But yes, this idea, I mean, I, one thing that I thought about is, you know, illness in Asian philosophy, as I read it, is really about imbalance. And aren't we in serious illnesses altogether? And I think people who have experienced the jagged edges of things not being fair or plain, uh, maybe those people, including us, have some insight to how to lead in repairing the breach. And even the years of the people who experience a lot of those edges um, might be a great like a place where some help or wisdom can be found in this very confounding time. Thank you. I have a comment. Um, I was very, very touched about the whole subject about gift because um, when I think about all that you guys speak about, I really see that, that you possess a gift that the world really needs. And the two gifts are your perspective as a woman. You have perspective, you have character, you have a, a personhood that men, a lot of men don't possess. And those are the skills that can do a lot of healing in the world. The second thing is you possess the Asian American experience. You tell the story that so many Asian American men and women really need to hear. So you are really a gift because you are straddling exactly what the world needs right now. So 
I, I hope that there's going to be a lot more Asian American women coming up in leadership in the ministry, and I think you guys are part of it. So whether you think that you're doing much or not, you are doing a great thing. So appreciate it. Thank you for that exhortation and encouragement. But I also know my name and I can say that you know we have fear of the voices. God's purpose is that the prophets were always every time the people strayed, he would raise up a prophet to, to be his mouthpiece, to be his voice, to speak a truth that he wants to impart to his people. And so I do believe that, you know, even here we are, we're sitting amongst prophets, prophetesses, however you want to describe yourselves. So that you know, we really do have to sometimes fully really embrace that. Um, you know, prophets are voices calling out from, from the deserts. Prophets are not looking to from towns. Uh, those are all biblical things. The quotes that you guys use were all prophets. In my Bible, I don't know of any happy to ten prophets. <laughs> so it don't exist. But there, there's, there's a certain place that, that God holds very, very dear in his heart for those prophetic voices. And so I just, you know, let them encourage you to continue to use those voices in ways that, that only he can use you. Thank you. I, I appreciate the, uh, the acknowledgement that, that perhaps prophets are not always being happy or content <laughs> in, the, in the conventional sense of those words, perhaps, but in fulfilling the calling and in being obedient, speaking uh, the words that are needed for, we said, the welfare. Of, of the city that you're in, wherever that might be, whatever community you're in, is um, yeah, it's a calling not to be taken with me. And also one in some ways that we all do want to carry together uh, as a community, as a collective community. So, um, yeah, before I ask Joyce to close us in prayer, um, and sure to give our closing announcements. Just want to make sure that there's nothing left on something that you feel in that prophetic presentation that you want to express. Um, it's such a privilege for me to hear parts of your stories glimpses and I imagine what your day-to-day -day is like, you know, and um, so this is something that I'd like to share with you and for others to hear is I have been like really tired and exhausted from being so good at the things that I'm good at <laughs> and working so hard to be good because our way into, into things is working hard and be really good at something and exceptionally good to be invited. And, uh, and I, I imagine, that I'm assuming, that you have had your journey of building your skills and knowing how to lead people. And, and yeah, all of that on top of the gifting and the awareness. And one thing that I am uh, learning, trying to learn, I'm committing to learn, is to rest. Mm -hmm. And I know we hear that a lot. Um, but I realize there's a point where you become really good at things, and so you become really helpful, and then you become very useful. Mm -hmm. And I realize I'm tired of being useful because I'm so good at the things that I do. And um, when somebody in a supervisory role, it really helps to have somebody like us working in the system. And um, in my own way of resisting that, you know, I've kind of stepped away where I can from institutional places where I felt like I was filling that, that very useful space. Um, and I 
because I am I'm going to step away. And what I have found in that stepping away is that rest that comes not from a security of being useful or productive um, or good at something. And I that's a learning edge for me. And I just wanted to voice that is where I am. Um, going back to uh, scriptures from the Old Testament the Hebrew Bible, uh, you know, when um, when Moses was really afraid and didn't know what to do, and I <laughs> keep going back to those contexts, so that's where I feel I am right now. Um, the voice that came for, for that particular leader is just go, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And what I need for me in my own personal life, as I'm making this vocational transition and I'm teaching to. Ministry is that it's not like I was acquiring more skills or developing more leadership or knowing how to preach better or do things better. Like maybe all I need to hold on to is the sufficiency. God says, This will be sufficient for you. My presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. And that's been my kind of source for hope and faith in this church in my life. I would have to embrace that. And I think as people, um, by socialization or just by our own personhood, that work hard and do things well and do things thoroughly and make sure the detail is added to, and that people are cared for, and that they're fed, all of that. Um, the, the, the pastor co worked that part of, of, of visionary pastors. He has um, written for a grant that just that just funds our celebration to just have fun together, to have more happen together. And guess what? We wrote this grant, and one of the one of the you know the question was, you know, what books will you read together? What kinds of you know continuing education will you do? And we said none. For us, the thing that we need to learn is no matter what we're not going to be in a gym or a spiritual you know dimension. To so um, I'm in that place, and, and yes, you're not connected. And so I'll be happy to see you next week to to do our first funded fun pastors meeting, and not do anything but just hang you out. Know? So that's it from a privilege. I'm saying that privilege of having seen that, but I'm in this place of like. Practicing that kind of rest and trust. Mm. And I see such brilliance. And I can only imagine what that looks like when you're in action. And so I want to just speak to all of us and say, oh, sometimes it's good to know that we don't have to do it. Thank you, Lord God, for this invitation to be accepted as good enough, to be developed enough, to be enough enough, to stand with you in one another. Lord God, send us forth to stay with the fresh sense of your majesty. As we listen to these mighty women who showed up with substance, Reflecting, inviting us into that space of belonging. Let us know that we are other yet beautiful, fully Asian, fully American, developing our Christian thoughts and hearts as we reflect on the women in the center of our hearts and homes, and as they stand ground on this earth alone, yet surrounded by your guiding light. 
arising from the discontent of being brushed aside or looked over. Wherever and whenever there is wisdom, gentleness, flexibility, truth telling, encouragement, generous love, there we will find you. In the workplace, in the fields, in the sweatshops, boardrooms, in the White House, and in the heart. These women are delicate yet hardy, resilient and persistent, stepping out from the shadows of the church, standing radiantly front and center, mentoring the Holocaust who are coming up. We thank Julianne Charlene Tree, America. Blessed are you once women wonderfully made, courageous, strong, and precious in your sight, in all your glorious and good patience. We pray today. Amen. Amen. So thank you all for being here today. And thank you so much to Julianne and Katie, Charlene and Erica and Joyce. You feed us with food and words, and we're so grateful. Um, just a one quick announcement before we leave, and, and that is that the next gathering event is going to be December 8th in Santa Ana. It's our one of our first. December 3rd, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, thank you. Um, it's going to be in Santa Ana at Church of the Messiah, and it's going to be dinner church, so please join us. And Joyce will be preparing a wonderful meal for us and the community, and it'll be lovely. I'm just going to say thank you to these amazing women. Um,